He's a former uh, director of the McLuhan program, Culture and Technology, deals with communication, art, technology, and media communication. And he will talk about the philosophical and cultural aspects which have been touched upon by previous speakers. Well, <clears throat> I would like first to express my gratitude to Ars Electronica to bring me back here and to once again provide me with an unforgettable experience. I have really found this day fascinating and uh, also putting me on a track which I had sort of, I had sort of uh, not forgotten completely, but uh, that I ha hadn't been thinking for a while, and putting me back on the track of origin made me see this image, if you'd like to, should I just, uh, how do I do this now? Do you put it on? Ah, okay. Just look at this image which you have seen today, but. It has become to, recently, for me, as important, as moving, I would say, as the image of the Earth seen from the moon for the first time. Um, there are two reasons that I find it absolutely fascinating. First of all, the idea that we could have an image like this, and I was, fasc I was happy, I have doubted still, until today, <laughs> I doubted its reality, and we were just talking about you know, machines showing us stuff and so on when Paul Davis said, no, no, this is the real thing. To imagine that this is the real thing, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, is an absolutely extraordinary experience for me. The second thing is the detail, which of course we know now uh, is, it's called anisotropy, anisotropies, and they are the kind of, all these variations, variations of heat and variations of design, which will have been proven later to become the actual galaxies in a world of expansion. So you can trace back that expansion and go back to that first image, and you'll find that there is coherence and consistency in the traveling of that, of, of that image. That's, in fact, so incredibly uh, powerful because that's the expansion from the Big Bang, but what actually keeps the galaxies together is that very weak force we just heard about, gravity. Gravity is the thing that brings the galaxies, to, keeps the galaxies together, keeps actually everything that we are together. So these two forces of expansion and contraction, creating the development that uh, we have, uh, that, uh, that uh, we are representing today, are, for me, uh, leading to an understanding of, let me get back to the other thing I wanted to show you, an understanding, whoops, I've just, I uh, just turned it off. I'll just have to call it again. Sorry about that. Thank goodness it's online. Very sorry about this. So w what I wanted to say was, obviously there isn't in any isotropy anything that we can relate to language. My, my talk is, is called the, uh, a, new, um, a New Adventure of Language. And I'll just give it back to you now. Uh -huh. Galaxy Lens 2. There we are. This will come right away. Um, it's called a new event of language. Why am I having a screen problem here? Can, uh, maybe I should. Uh... This is normal. I always have technical problems, especially at Ars Electronica. And it's not their fault. They are a fantastic technician. It's entirely my own, so I apologize. But we'll resolve that as soon as we can. Yeah. I think it's because I have this. Yeah. All right, so the, what I want to talk about while this gets going, I'll just say what it is. Um, the new adventure of language, there we are. I think now we're happy. Okay. Well, I need a bit of diversion, don't worry. The new adventure of language, um, I will talk about at the end, but I want to, uh, I want to do a bit like many, what many people did today, which is to, um, to talk about the historical background to what is, what is occurring right now. So what you're seeing there, and unfortunately it's not very easy to read the, these images, are, is a, a bit where, where I'm going. So I want to talk about language and origin and the relationship between language, language and origin. And I, I'm not saying that language was 
planned in the anisotropies. I'm not saying there was anything that was planned in particular. Well, what I'm saying is that the condition for life, and that's why I asked about the role of supernovas, the condition for life are, are included in what has happened, and we have just the right measure, since we heard, as we heard from Paul Davis, to arrive at a situation where life happens and where eventually language comes out and where from language develops very, very fast and very strongly consciousness. And so I want to talk about the three phases of language we know so far, and I want to talk about the three phases of electricity, which is the present sort of present condition of language. Then I want to have a chance to talk about where we are now using McLuhan. This is the year of the 100th anniversary of McLuhan's birth, so I'm still very much thinking about him and how he thought and how he saw things. But more than anything else, I want to meditate with you on a speech of, uh, I mean, a sentence of Giordano Bruno and another one of William James. The one of Giordano Bruno is here and you will be able to refer to it as you want. And I want you to know them both now as I am beginning because you will see that that's the whole idea. I'm trying to resonate through those. It's not matter that creates the mind, it's the mind that creates matter by Giordano Bruno, who was burned at the stake for his heretical propositions by the Catholic Church uh, in 1600 at uh, the famous Campo di Fiore in Roma. Um, I believe that, to a point, this statement and many others by Giordano Bruno do represent some of the more forward thinking of the uh, era of quantum mechanics. And the second thought is here, and I'll just show it to you, and it's by William James. Consciousness is the evolution of the universe turning around to see itself. Now, when you put those two things together, and you can put them any way you want, and I hope that by the end of this talk you will have put them in a way that is satisfying, you come up with some rather strange perception about where, who we are and where we are. So let's start with this particular thing. Why privilege language? Why is language so, so important? Well, clearly, it's, also, it's part of many, many uh, creation myths. What you see in the background there is just classification of the different types and different sources of creation myth. I won't go into the detail. It's not absolutely necessary. But it's also true that in, in the uh, uh, Christian uh, religion, clearly, uh, and, and we, we have a myth of creation that is based on let there be light and based on, on, on language. It's also an origin of perception. Many, many researchers have been done, and the first one to make that point was Voltaire saying that our experience and our understanding comes from our senses. You can go from Voltaire to Sapir Whorf and his theory about how we see the world through the words we use. You actually come up with the idea that language is fundamental to the relationship that it has with our consciousness. We think what we know, we know what we know through language that is shared among people. So that's a very strong thing. But of course, being a McLuhanist, I have to also recognize the fact that language is also affected profoundly by its carriers. And so here are the three carriers of language. Here you cannot see the image terribly well. It doesn't matter because that's it. the first big segment is the time when language was oral, carried by the body, and carried by the body and reaching only the distance of the voice or the carried by voices that actually would uh, run to, from, to another place, but very limited range. The second part here, the smaller part, and it shows an incredible acceleration, is language carried by writing. Suddenly we move into a literate world, and from that, and I will get to some detail, you move on to a very shorter period which is carried by print, and an extraordinary acceleration of culture at that time, and then finally in 10 generations carried by electricity. So what difference does that make? Oral, it's out of the body. It's produced by bodies. It's always shared and always live. You know? It's limited to voice and drums, no records, isolated groups, and local dialects. So basically, the reach of language there is still very limited. We know very well that, and, uh, that uh, once it is written, it is archived to a certain extent. And it doesn't matter what kind of writing it is. It is archived, and hence, it's available over periods of time also available to people who go by. So hence, the actual expansion of the language domain is, 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 is increased considerably. And when, in fact, the language itself is represented such as it is in alphabets, any kind of alphabet, language then is suddenly an object of study, and it becomes 
um, it, it, it does that, it creates a possibility, first of all, it's instrumentalized in a different way, and it is allowing people to create much larger vocabularies and arrive at science and, and, and the various kind of specialization that we have seen, that we have seen today. So basically, and also the memory contained by language is much, much more expanded. In the electric age which we are in today, language is both in and out of the body. And by the way, the fact that language is in and out of the body is extremely important to understand how we relate to ourselves and to people, right? If language is outside of the body, it'll control bodies. If you cannot control language, you can control language by poetry, by orders, by position. You can, there are several ways you can, but basically, you're always going to depend on the relationship that you have with the other. Once you actually have language written down, and particularly when the language itself and not ideas are written down, you can start actually reading it silently. And by reading it silently, you internalize it. And by internalize it, you appropriate it. And by appropriating it, you create yourself your own identity and you take control over language. A total reversal between being controlled by language, by, by the voice of the father, the chief, the king, the the priest, the magician, whatever it is, to suddenly controlling language yourself and becoming a so-called private citizen. This is very important. But in the, in, in the present stage, what is happening is that with electricity, language is suddenly in and out of the body. Yes, we can still read. Yes, we can still process stuff silently. Yes, but now we are constantly connected. And the speed of language has changed completely. The most important moment of this, uh, this story, this first, the first moment of this uh, third adventure of language is the telegraph. The telegraph is a meeting of language and electricity. That is the maximum speed multiplied by the maximum complexity. The possibility of infinite variation, starting with fiction, but fiction started with just with the alphabet, uh, starting with all the, kind, all the possibilities that we have of communications, we have an extraordinary situation, but, but, and this becomes very critical at our own time, again, we are controlled by the system. We are controlled by electricity. We are, we are the Pinocchios of our own keyboards. So language takes control over us, we take control. There's a tug of war now, because who's the chief? Who's the master of language? fundamentally. And so things are, and of course language is also distributed globally, which it never was before. And the memory that, it, uh, that, it, that accumulates around it, as we can see with, all, with, with the web, is, is considerable. And with electricity, it controls most of the life situation today. So we are in a situation today where uh, those, the, we are now in, in, the, in the electronic change, and so what are the, what are the, what's the, what's the history of language in that particular context? Three phases of electricity. First, analog, with energy, heat, and light. That's how we started to use the electricity. Language is transported, like on television, on radio, or on uh, telephone, it's transported. The signal is transported. It's accelerated, amplified, and redistributed globally. That's the first phase. The second phase is digital. Suddenly, language becomes information. Becomes, I mean, the electricity turns, turns information into, into, into bits. Language is smashed into bits. And we, have, we are achieving not the transport of signal, but the instant construction of signal the way it happens in your head. When you think, you construct the signal on the spot, on, on demand. And with the present situation, electric electricity allows us to have not only a random access as we would have in our own mind, but a random access of information that's out there. So that particular uh, transformation is, is, is very important. And the third phase is the present phase, the phase of the mobile, evolution of the wireless, active communication. Twitter, I think, is probably one of the most mature. There's a history of maturation of networks, of course, from the telegraph all the way uh, to Twitter. And that maturation is always increasing complexity, increasing spread, increasing autonomy also of the production of signals. So that growth is, 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 is extremely powerful. And of course, we have all instant creation and instant distribution of, of signal. So what are the consequences of, what are the consequences of, uh, of, of this takeover of language by electricity, first of all, um, increase of complexities, I've said, connectivity, speed, precision, and also sensoriality. The interesting thing about what happened with the alphabet is that it desensorialized human discourse and hence created the arts because the arts were the retake of the, sensor, the sensory things abandoned by 
written discourse. The arts are the resensorialization of an alphabetic culture. But what happens today, we don't need the arts in the same way because in fact, all the electricity brings back the senses into human discourse and human exchange. So that's, a, that's an, import, an important change. So um, I, see, I see now language as becoming, for example, via Twitter, a collective pulse, uh, responding to emergencies globally in near absolute real time with instant and infinite ramification, totally delocalized, um, and, and of course, I'm quoting McLuhan here, the future half of the world be spying and reporting on the other half, which is exactly what's happening. So the, as you can see, what the spread is, is absolutely uh, enormous. So where are we now? Again, I'm going to use McLuhan, which is as good as any other for, for this particular thing, one of his most interesting predictions of 1962. The next medium, whatever it is, it may be the extension of consciousness. It will include television as its content, not as its environment. I think so far you follow me, I don't have to make an explanation. It'll transform television in an art form. Now that's a little bit more complicated. How, what's television in an art form today? YouTube, YouTube is the means of production of television, the most expensive medium of language uh, you know, carrying in the hands of anybody. The possibility of producing and also of redistributing the thing. A computer as a research and communication instrument, that's not a very big prediction now because of course we take it for granted, but at the time he said that, the first computers filled this room. It could enhance retrieval. Yes, we surely have that situation with the internet and with the... But what I like even more is it would obsolesce mass library organization. Now, how did you get that? How did you get the fact that with tags, we actually now can connect whatever we look for to whatever is available without having to go to any kind of classification or hierarchy? So indeed, libraries have asked themselves some very serious questions about what's happening to language in this new cognitive environment. And uh, the best one, I think, is the, is the next one. Retrieve the in individual's encyclopedic function. I'm sure that you've all uh, recognized Wikipedia there, Wikipedia or anything you put at online available for people. You recognize that extraordinary possibility that each one of us potentially can actually contribute to everybody else's knowledge at this particular point. And, and in fact, it is happening more and more. The rest is banal. But we heard this morning that 10% of uh, the uh, European economy is now is based on uh, what's happening with the web. It says flip into a private line to speedily, speedily tailored data of a saleable kind. So this is where we are now. This is where we are in a situation where language is globalized, where it is shared by everybody, where everybody can participate, where people can actually call for, for help, where we have actually an exchange. It doesn't make, as McLuhan obviously predicted himself, it doesn't make the world a global peaceful environment. On the contrary, we are having some very serious trouble and we have to actually overcome this serious trouble and perhaps the discussion that we are having today helps to do that. So I've been interested in a French man who sends me regularly a newsletter called Les Signaux Faibles du Futur, the weak signal of the future. Actually, this Philippe Quin, who is a very interesting fellow, a consultant, uh, takes some very anodyne ex 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 things that happen that he sees in a newspaper. In fact, it's a bit like McLuhan. He would, come, he would come into class and he would open a newspaper and say, well, what's here? What can we see from this particular event that's happened today? He does the same and then uh, says, we are going to see development and, and build scenario on the basis of these signs. Here's an example, which is rather fun. Sorry, not, uh, uh, this is not what I wanted to show you. We'll leave that alone. The example is Churchill. Re in, in a picture of Churchill, you can't see it very well, remanaged so that they don't see the cigar. This is the Association of the Anti-Smokers of London that has created this new image for, so that people are not exposed to having uh, uh, the inspiration or the example of a very, very famous man actually smoking. Um, that shows a certain, the, the signal there is the signal where we are moving towards and the whole anti-smoking, legitimate, valuable and everything movements has shown this. We're moving towards a social, a social kind of morality uh, that uh, is going beyond even uh, beyond, the, beyond the evidence. So some of the weak signals, I won't show them all because Obviously, we have to, I have to move on, but, and I want you to, the, the first one, the genome-wide machine learning networks, I mean, you can actually go and explore, near, and you can explore affinities between genes when you are studying a way of creating new forms. It's an extraordinary uh, aspect of a weak signal of what's coming in terms of what we're gonna be creating. The return of medieval magic, I'll pass 
although anyone who has seen augmented reality tools and toys are going to recognize that there is a, an extraordinary good reason for people to go to see uh, to read and see Harry Potter uh, so much. We're coming literally to, we're, we're just by opening the, the door of your car, taking your keys and, and snapping on the little thing, you're actually back into a kind of a medieval magic operation. We're, we're back into this kind of thing. Transparency, well, clearly the news of the world scandal is one aspect of transparency. I want to tell you something about that which is actually quite important and I'm working, I'm working on this now. It's what I call the digital unconscious. The digital unconscious is everything that's known about you that you don't know that people know about you or don't you, that you don't even know that exists about you. I'll be giving you an example. It's, it's, it's so badly, the, 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 uh, the narrative is so badly done that I want to, don't want you to suffer through this, but digital mirror, anybody has seen digital mirror, tried digital mirror? Well, it's one of these things that are truly part of your digital unconscious. Digital mirror is a tool that a company can use to see the kind of relationship that any one of the employees has with the other employees by actually studying their email, which is, the, which is a possession of the company, obviously, studying their email for the last three or four years. And they find out what kind of relationship you have with people, and they simulate this by actually a planetary system. I would have loved to see you show it to you, but I couldn't actually fix the, the exact moment. It's a very long presentation and very boring. But what's not boring is that that thing, your email, contains a formidable source of information that can actually be used for you or against you, but certainly not necessarily by you. So you have to understand that behind that, there is also a, a new kind of linguistic dimension that, that uh, we are living. The other weak singular feature is I take from art, and it is quite an amazing, it's, artist, it's a French artist, uh, called Christophe Bruno who created this thing. Now, let me see if I can go and get it for you. Normally, I should be able to get out of this, so I guess I can't. Okay, so if, if I can't show it to you, I can describe it, and it's not a big deal. Um, hmm. Let's see if we can come with it. Uh, no, doesn't matter. It, you don't need to see it. What it's called, it's called um, Wi-Fi SM, with the very satiric intention of sadomasochism in it. Um, you put a little piece of, you can see that, uh, that thing on, on this guy's, uh, on this guy's uh, neck, right? I'll just close it and you'll be able to see it uh, on, the con on the other, uh oh, it won't close. Oh well, another technical problem. Um, I guess I just have to go through the operation. I'll close this. Oh dear. Do I have a freeze? Okay, doesn't matter. Um, so what I am uh, describing here, you put something on your body. Right, this little uh, one of them pastille is a that you have on the, si uh, on, the on the side. And the other is a you key in on a site which is connected to it by radio Plano, signals. And it basically Ten words that are negative research. words like war, no fear, torture, uh, problems in the world. More and more the and plane, automatically, 5,000 sources, media sources on the online are analyzed in order to come to a certain number of these words. The notion right? of, of the mind. Uh oh, you see what's happened? In We're hearing in the bad. background but it can never uh, be somebody who's talking. Oh, I'm sorry about this. this is... can't be ah, there we are. But I will yes, try and stop the previous, previous thing. While neuroscientists may think that the thing. What is this? Thing. Anyway, here it is. That's, it is presented as a commercial product. And what happens is that, uh, see, you, you say uh, words like death, kill, murder, torture, rape, war, past a certain level of numbers of references in 5,000 media around the globe, you get an electric shock. So what's great about that? Well, it's a, it's a weak signal of the future. It's the return of a medieval, another medieval kind of thing, which is our sensibility towards the world. It's, the rich, it's an electronic fleece. You know, when people were banging themselves, the monks were actually trying to atone for the sins of the world. We're not gonna go back there. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is that the relationship that is attempted by so many artists today, and I think of Maurice Benayoun, Christophe Bruno, uh, there are three or four people that I can think of who are creating these software for you to study the situation of the world and relate to it. The difference, of course, is if you see it on, as you can see, the World Clock, which is a wonderful site. If you haven't seen it, go and see that. You see all the numbers that come and that tell you how many babies are born and how people have died and how many cars have been built. That's fine. You see that and you see it in front of you. It's objective. You're distant. But the idea of the artist 
Not that we will do it, but the idea of Iates of putting it to your skin is exactly what I think is such an extraordinary uh, perception and, a, and a, big, uh, a weak signal of the future. Let me go back to uh, that presentation and hopefully I can close it. Yes, cool. Um, and so let me just then say, uh, after, after uh, these weak signals, and there, and, and there are many more of where we're going, I'd like to see where, in fact, following up again an example of McLuhan, which is that when you push a situation to a certain speed, you reverse its effect. What are the reversals that we can expect today? Well, the first one is clearly the reversal between nature and culture. Clearly now we are, you are beginning to dominate uh, by using cloning, by using uh, recombinant engineering, genetic engineering, uh, and by also getting back to the origin, so the way we're doing now, we're, see, we're finding that culture is now taking over. Where we were dependent on nature, now nature is more dependent on, in fact, nature, this nature, this globe is entirely dependent on, on culture today. To our damned uh, future or not, it all depends what will happen. So that's one of the first things. The other one is, I wanted to make you hear what McLuhan had to say about this. Uh, as, uh, the, McLuhan said in 1957, Sputnik surrounded, now what's happening? Why don't I have a sound? Uh, I'm changing styles in the arts. Okay. The artist is Let's always a jump ahead of technology and is engaged really in giving you images of what sort of effects it's likely to have upon you later on. So that the changing style in the arts, like pop art and so on, are pretty good indications of the real meaning of television. Uh, pop art simply tells you the only art form left for you today is your own natural environment. You have now to program it as if it were a, an art, a work of art, and an environment. So uh, to suddenly be confronted with the need to use the human environment itself as art form is one way of drawing attention to the fact that the new environments created by new media require a certain amount of human programming and control e uh, for our psychic life. And so what, what McLuhan was saying about that was the, in October 1957, when Sputnik surrounded the Earth, he turned, and Sputnik was a technology that was turning nature itself as its content and hence transforming it as a programmable environment. So I'm still following the argument of, um, of uh, both uh, Giordano Bruno and of the idea of consciousness is evolution turning on itself. Another example that I wanted to give you um, was the one example, you probably have seen this toy and maybe it's being used here. I don't know, I haven't seen yet the exhibit, but and probably may not be pertinent for this year's theme, but Emotive is a, basically a video game or sort of a game. You put a helmet on as this guy who has, you see the helmet uh, on his uh, head and you think anything that, with a little bit of training, but not much, you think about something uh, that you want to, ha to see happen on the screen, and it does. So you have a direct connection between your mind and the screen. So the direct connection between your mind and the screen creates, here's an, an explanation of how it works, I will let you hear some of it, um, now, all interaction by one of its inventors. Is going to be far more in the ratio. We'll be able to use our brain um, and our facial expressions and our emotional experiences to really experience content in an entirely new ways. And what we've created is a brain-computer interface that really transforms the way that humans interact with machines. The Emotive Epic wireless headset has 16 independent sensors that pick up electrical brain signals on the surface of the scalp. We identify um, a signature for a particular thought or a particular emotion, and then in real time, we classify those brain patterns. So when you think it, it happens on the screen. You think push, the object propels forward. And then my master's showing me how to pull using that tree. And then he'll ask me to focus all my thoughts on pulling that tree towards me. There are 13 individual detections. Push, when pull, I tried and it works. lift, drop, left, right, and then rotation in six different axes in a 3D environment. You can even visualize an object disappearing, and it will. 
Okay, enough of but this because is... obviously it's a very commercial kind of presentation. But the whole thing is, it looks like a toy, but it's the same. It's the same kind of thing that uh, we were talking about in the present state of compu quantum computing. It is something that is a weak signal of the future that actually is eventually going to happen. The fact that we can directly command our own computers. Um, and that would create another extraordinary relationship that we have, that we have with language. Um, and f to that extent, uh, back to the idea of Giordano Bruno, that it's the mind that creates matter and not the other way around, it's very interesting to hear the conversation we had today around that particular theme. We have two events that are happening today. On the one hand, we're looking at philosophy that's more and more interested in huge solipsism, almost autist, autistic, Yes, reality is only what I see. Uh, even in, 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 uh, in art criticism now, people are talking about virtual reality. Ettinger, or Ettinger has written a book about how virtual reality, in fact, is untraceable except in how you actually use it. There is a tendency towards a huge solipsism, on the other hand, and an evisceration of the inside of the individual with our own children who are putting their profile, or actually are having their profile, as I said, hidden uh, uh, from view in the digital unconscious, which in fact is somehow eliminating the kind of density of selfhood that we had acquired as readers. So we're gonna find both that double tendency of you know, expanding to the size of the universe, each one of us, and at the same time being reduced to be part of a very large group of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of network people. And for that, I am very indebted also to one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto, Norman Deutsch, who I'm going to show you next. Deutsch has written a book which became quite a good uh, seller called the brain, the brain That Changes Itself. Well, in fact, it is now uh, supported by other neuro neuroscientists that indeed we can have an impact on our own thinking and on how to change our own mind. It's, it sounds like a banality, and at the same time, it's something which is now recognized as being very important. And the conclusion that Norman draws right here, and there are many things that I recommend that you read the book for, uh, is particularly charming and interesting, and particularly pertinent to what we've been discussing so far. Rene Descartes, going back to Plato, said human beings consist of two substances. Uh, one of them is a mental substance which has to do with the, the soul and the other is a physical substance that has to do with the brain. This goes all the way back to Plato and it basically kind of divides human beings in two. Neuroscientists following Descartes basically focused more and more and more on the brain which was seen to be machine-like and work according to the laws of Galileo. And we lost interest for several hundred years in the notion of, of the mind and the soul. In some ways, it was banished. But it can never be banished for very long. And the reason it can't be banished for very long is because while neuroscientists may think that the thing that's most certain is the, thing about the, the things about the brain you can, you can measure, in fact, it's probably the case that what's most certain in our lives is our subjective experience. So the notion of modern science is having to always be on the side of the objective may be a serious miscalculation. And the attempts to better understand the subjective may actually be um, the way science ultimately redeems itself. Right, well, I'm told that I should rush, so I will uh, skip Hawkins, who has, is giving us a warning that um, Yes, we can actually go well beyond the, uh, well, no, I'll show it to you. It's wonderful. It's only one minute anyway. <laughs> it's really quite interesting talk. We'll survive talk. long enough to make the leap to deeper space. I think we have a good chance of surviving long enough to colonize the solar system. However, there is nowhere else in the solar system anything like as suitable as the Earth. So it is not clear if we would survive if the Earth was made unfit for habitation. To ensure our long-term survival, we need to reach the stars. That will take much longer. So I wanted to conclude to, to this idea of the next, um, the next uh, adventure of language. The next adventure of language, I see it as exactly what we were talking about with uh, uh, Professor Zeilinger, who 
much. Well, everybody impressed me enormously, but I had never heard any more confident declaration about what would happen uh, with quantum mechanics and the applications such as uh, um, quantum computers. I knew about the cryptography, and probably most of you did, but the idea that the quantum computer is actually thinkable is a very important, uh, important development. I think that quantum, the application of language in quanta is, is part of its next adventure. Uh, at least a foreseeable one. Maybe Lisa Randall will have to wait longer for the one where language is applied to string theory. But what is important about the metaphors, the technological metaphors that we use, the carriers that we use, as I said at the beginning, is that they actually condition also our psychology. And one of the things that would be happening with quantum computing would be that it would inspire us to actually, instead of making separation between things and putting frontiers, making an equilibration between them. A quantum computer can go so fast as to be able to reconcile many, many opposites and, 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 and conflicts and difficult problems. And for the moment, that, we really do need that. We would need a situation where, uh, and we know that the dominant technology actually dominates the world in general, um, we would need, in fact, to be able to reconcile people's agendas across the globe in such a fashion that actually we could respond to the major problem, which is actually protecting the environment, which is what, uh, what, what uh, of course, uh, Hawking is telling us. And I can see this as happening. Why can I see it as happening? Because of what is happening today and what we have learned today about, about the Large uh, Hadron Collider. There is no better example of an extraordinary return of consciousness, of consciousness returning on over evolution, that to be able to trace back into time and recognize all the various stages in which we have gone through and actually identify the very form of, of nature, we see there the collaboration of people from all over the world, of different kinds of expertise, uh, the investment of probably more money than any, any, any sort of uh, scientific venture has ever seen, which means a kind of a will to go back to those origins that I am comparing, and I see I've wrote it here, uh, consciousness would be consciousness supported by language with its new technologies. It's actually a counterforce to the expansion. It is like gravity. It's a very weak force, but it is going back. It's actually going on the, in the other direction than the expansion of the universe. So yes, I must say that I am looking forward to the next discoveries of the LHC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've just been told that there's not too much time for a discussion, so in fact, uh, we'll just have a few questions to the speakers as they stand and sit where they sit right now, rather than having them move around. So we have time for a few questions. Ein paar Fragen sind möglich, um, leider nicht sehr viele. As I said, we have just time for a few questions, because there's another program going on tonight. Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for such a lovely presentation. It got me so many thinking. So I don't know where to start. But I first found extremely your presentation extremely relevant with uh, philosopher Derrida's explication about uh, phonocentric culture in the West, uh, oral language taking uh, taking over the written language, and like setting up the definite linkage between consciousness and uh, the language. And I found if, if will be there any possibility for electric language to deconstruct this kind of phonocentric, uh, phonocentric culture. Uh, I think it's uh, the Eugene Thacker, uh, he said in, uh, in the book Biomedia about like uh, the electrifying of the language or like, uh, uh, language became, uh, becoming a biological entity kind of deconstructs the la uh, linking between the consciousness and body within the language. Uh, do you see any th that kind of possibility? Um, so I'm not quite sure I understood the question. Um, could you make it in one sentence? And, uh, sorry to ask you, but I didn't quite hear it. I wasn't hearing very well. So can you ask me again? Uh, uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm just asking the current phase of linguistic development do you see as like uh, there's the constructive nature uh, deconstructing de um, phonocentric culture in the West? Uh, 
the intercultural, for sure, and I'm glad, I'm glad you had the question, the intercultural collaboration is precisely what I'm saying will be needed and for which we would need a, um, a processor that which contain enormous quantities of uh, um, data simultaneously. And that's why I think that the quantum computing, while it is in infancy, uh, is the kind of thing that will reconcile as we already see, I mean, there's all already many, many programs online that allow you to change, uh, uh, to, to, to go from one language to the other. So we have seen these translation, but I'm seeing more translation of human experience uh, that will be actually reconciling um, the needs of the people to the needs of the planet. That's what I see. And what I'm saying about the kind of sort of on one on the one level a certain le loss of identity of, of a private identity I see much a great a greater rise in the group identity and a, a cultural identity so we are going to see some very strong uh, geopsychological changes I think so I think and in fact we have to go through a fair bit of these transformation every time that we change the carrier Every time that language changes carry, we have some really deep transition problems to deal with. 200 years of religious war after the invention of the printing press. Two major world wars after the invention of the telegraph and radio. So, and now the present situation of war is, uh, is, 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 is um, terrorism, which is a normal growth pain in, a, in an era of, of totally environment information. So that's what I'm seeing is we have growth pains. And then, uh, but I think the, they get less hard as we go along. Derek, um, what, I, what I see is that there, uh, I would like you to think about the growth pain of WikiLeaks and the communication that, uh, that should stay, let's say, secret for secret agencies and all this. And do you, th uh, do you see this as a ling linguistic phenomena? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and where do you think that leads? Well, apart, uh, among the various things that built the digital conscious is, of course, the information that is stored in data banks that is either used or not used. And so you use specific uh, interfaces in order to bring it to the open. For example, uh, you and I can ask the same question uh, at the same time in the same words. Uh, in two different places to Google, and we'll have different answers because the digital profile is created by uh, what you call these parameters, and those parameters are actually geared to give you an answer which is more pertinent for you and an answer which is more pertinent for me. So far, so good, but we don't know that profile. Or if we do, to get to it is quite a complicated affair. Every one of these, and WikiLeaks is a typical situation where one system, in this particular case a website and an organization, becomes the interface between an unconscious that has to be revealed to the consciousness, creating the consequence that we have. It is a phenomenon of language, and in fact, it is an important one because it actually signals that one of the properties of electricity is to bring things to transparency. It is the nature of electricity to be transparent. Fascinatingly, what we heard before about cryptography, uh, having your own quantum cryptography channel, I think we may actually have to resort to that to just keep an identity. That may be the future, in fact, to have, to, to have our, you know, uh, what is it called, a cryptography, <laughs> to quantum cryptography channels. WikiLeaks, of course we will need secrets. Of course you do. But the possibility of keeping secrets is becoming less and less possible. The news of the world scandal is exactly what I'm talking about. So we're going to have to deal with that. And the number of things that are not yet used for or against you that is known about you, we haven't even begun to plumb this. I'm not trying to be an alarmist. This is normal. It is normal to lose one's identity under the impact of electricity. It's not necessarily something we want to hold on to. I do. I was brought up on books, so were you. But the point is, we are going through this transformation a little bit blind. <laughs> there don't seem to be any other questions, kind of weiteren Fragen. In dem Fall würde ich so, you talk. Um, what I'm interested in, you, you mentioned um, uh, this um, um, idea of McLuhan of 62, the idea of extension of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you showed it very well how um, new media are going towards this direction. My question now relates. Uh, uh, about the mechanism of production of language that uh, are coming before or under this conscious state. Uh, 
So you have and you showed very well how this higher state allows you this um, towards uh, this, this process of uh, infinite speed. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism uh, below, and by asking these questions, I don't want actually to go towards the solipsistic philosophy that, uh, that, uh, that relates everything question. to the subject. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> but uh, actually, well, putting the question in terms of effect, and effort for me is not something that is uh, close into the subject, but I'd see it's something that maybe uh, from a quantum analogy is not, so uh, um, so extendable how uh, as the upper level of language would be. So you could, you can visually go very far. You can langu linguistically go very far, but there's something uh, holding. Well, the individual or also the collective level is just a lower uh, um, affective level that is not so strong. And I'm thinking, did you think about this? relations or is it a problem for me, you or maybe maybe not no i i wasn't um i haven't been i have been i haven't been studying that particular level but i have been interested in some of the geo geopolitical uh, association and collaboration that exists today europe is probably a little bit shaky right now it's got it's going through gross pains which is which are terrible but europe is an example i think of the move it's it's the continental stage before a global stage of collaboration and linguistic uh, agreement, even though we are across many different cultures and many different kinds of, and different kind of language. There is there in a geopolitical trend, which we see in South America, North America, Europe, Asia, everywhere we see these kind of big, large reorganization at a continental level that actually show that we are organizing ourselves towards that direction. If we didn't have banks and government fooling around, we'd probably be there already. But the fact is, we have to, that's another growth pain, you know, from, from uh, Enron to uh, what happened recently. The, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> I, can't, I, can't, can't, I can't remember all those scandals. No, we, are, we have growing pains at every level. But eventually, the kind of larger groups of collaboration do exist, and they will actually, I think they will prevail. If that's an answer to your question. Okay, I'm going to give it a third last try um, to stop the discussion here. <laughs> Thank you for your presence. Brilliant.